Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Ed, we're going to look at a really weird book today. I, uh, I describe it as like Steranko meets Godzilla. And uh, we'll get into the reasons for that. But it's, it's an odd one with Mr. Monster. But of course, before we do, I want to point out that we are both cartoonists and makers. And your newest series, Red Room Trigger Warnings, was supposed to be out in December, has been pushed back to February due to paper shortages. But want to make everybody well aware of it, and uh, let's do a big push on this one. All the Red Room fans out there, buy this the day that it comes out. Memorize these covers. Be ready for this new series to launch and launch hard and overcome those paper shortages. And hopefully go right back into reprints right away. The other place everybody can find their Red Room fix this holiday season is the Red Room Trade Paperback, the perfect gift for the horror fan in your life and available wherever you buy books, local comic shop, bookstore, or online. That is Red Room, the antisocial network. You can also find my latest books. Uh, the Plain Janes is my young adult graphic novel. You can see 500 pages of high school artists in a small, quiet suburban town, bored with their suburban lifestyle, start doing public displays of art that leads to all kinds of trouble for everybody involved uh, with Cecil Castellucci. And this, again, is available wherever books are sold. I like how you get a little mole on her face, man, so that we never get confused. <laughs> you got to identify this character somehow. But uh, this is this is one, Ed, that I missed whenever it came out. It comes out in the late 90s, and it's kind of a manga parody, if you will, by Ken Brusnick and, uh, and Michael T. Gilbert, the creator of Mr. Monster. They talk a little bit about the context of creating this in the back, and it's funny to see, you know, manga, 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 that this, that's basically the, the reasoning behind this story and how it comes together. And Ken Brusnack, a lot of us know him as a letterer, a longtime letterer with Howard Chaikin, longtime assistant of Jim Steranko, for uh, over a decade, I believe, he worked with Jim Steranko, was the letterer for Mr. Monster, and came up with this concept. So this particular story is actually written and drawn by him, uh, in addition to the lettering, with a little bit of a pitch-in from Michael T. Gilbert, the uh, the creator of Mr. Monster. Just mostly drawing Mr. Monster the way he explains it in the uh, in the afterword. I'm, I'm going to say it right here, right now. <laughs> Ken, draw more comics. Like very like, fair. Like I, I love, I love looking at this thing, man. I can't believe. First off, I didn't know he had chops, and uh, second off, it's it's strong looking artwork. Uh, the insecurity, like I'm, this is me projecting on onto Ken, but you said it right. Like he's he's working in lettering at a time when you receive the penciled pages, so you're receiving these penciled. How we're shaking pages. You're assisting Jim Steranko. Yeah, that's tough. So you might have some insecurity as per your own drawing ability, but we're here telling you today, Ken, your fucking drawings look awesome. Like, please draw comics. Yeah, we're, we're going to enjoy going through this, but you can see the, the nod to some of these manga characters like Astro Boy on the cover and... Uh, nod to Godzilla vs. Bambi yes. on the cover about the step on Mr. Monster. And Mr. Monster, one of those like early creator-owned characters that bounced around several different publishers uh, you know, throughout the 80s, 90s, 2000s. Eclipse, Dark Horse, exactly. Image Comics for a cup of coffee. So uh, kind of interesting just to get Mr. Monster on the channel. You know, has I don't think we've looked at anything with that, uh, with that character before. So first thing to note, this awesome red and blue color palette. It's, it's so funny because... Uh, these are these are old ass dudes uh, who who are seeing that these Japanese comics are are coming into the game. And as weird as it will sound to the young listeners out there and stuff, and, and certainly people who have been acclimated to the cartoonist kayfabe way of life, where we look at everything, these American comic guys, it was a very like by by Chevy, not Honda kind of yes. environment where. To this day, uh, the old dudes at the comic shop will tell me like, "I just can't, I just can't read books backwards. I just, right. it's, I don't know how to do it. Yes. I can't do it." Uh, yeah, they're very stuck in, stuck in their ways and stuff. So I say all of that because these guys are doing their manga parody, but there's not one manga that's ever looked like this with this kind of two. Like I, I know that you'll get like a couple of pages or whatever, and it might be like a black like black line with like a this red or something so these guys it's interesting to see what they see in manga because it's not anything that we really associate with manga that much that's a good point and it's before the big manga you know you know like there there are waves of manga coming into the country uh you know certainly in the 90s we had seen a lot of manga but it wasn't the big push that we get in the early 2000s when it invades bookstores uh so interesting 
time period for like, okay, we're going to parody manga. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a funny time period. I love how this looks, though. Me too. And I love the idea that uh, somebody does a parody of manga that maybe doesn't really know it that well, but you still get kind of an interesting point of view. You know, I don't know another book that looks like this. It's 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 a good comic. Like, as a reading experience, it's whatever. I love this this airplane thing too that mr monster flies you like, had well done on things. the drawing yeah, on this thing yeah totally like like i do get a sense that like bresnak has that autograph projector machine and and it's just like you know i've seen this thing like whenever they were creating those like rocket technology and stuff by the way speaking of jim Steranko, <laughs> did he model for uh for doc here doc he... stern baby <laughs> uh, a series of two-page spreads one of the things that you need to sell the audience the readership if you're dealing with a Godzilla versus some terrestrial, you know, hu humanoid being, we got to get scale. Yeah. And you, we'll see it on some spreads. You you never see all of Godzilla in like any panel. And and you know, hard nods to to Japan. Make make sure we know that this is a parody of manga and that manga comes from uh, you know it's Japanese comics. Um, the other piece that's written about in the back by Michael T. Gilbert is that Ken laid out this story or wrote this story, and I think it was like. 15 pages yeah, shorter. And so that was something else that Gilbert contributed was expanding this to mostly two page spreads, which I think work really well. It's one more thing that makes this book unique, you know, and if you go beyond the parody and just think of this as a comic that I found randomly in a 50 cent bin and had no idea existed. It's a great pull. Yeah, it you is. Know, it's like, it's such a cool thing to open up and find this. Ken, draw more comics, bro. This is freaking awesome. Yeah, and and he does do well with the two page spread, taking advantage of that size piece. You know, even the Godzilla foot where you put it next to your uh, little figures in the foreground. Although the blue on blue, this is a spot where you know the silhouette struggles a little bit, but you're gonna have that. You know, production wise, so Kevin Horn is your colorist, and essentially what they did is made the black line blue, and then did a little bit of blending. You'll see, you know, like that that purpley almost black that you get where the two colors are overprinting. Um, great ideas like like putting this whole thing together this way i think was a brilliant plan like i would copy this kind of coloring approach of like take two colors and play with what you can get from them man if they would have just used that jim rug filter man and had some of that like gritty pulpy paper like that that could have like solved a lot of the problems because manga really never like look like this but like Man, if, they're, they're the worst for paper, like yeah. that, especially the phone books, like the original printings of all the, the first time manga stuff is so uh, like toothy and stuff, that paper. Because if they didn't just recycle that paper over a million times, that, that, Japan's an island and that's a lot of manga being consumed. Yes. So like they need to like throw that shit in the trash, pulp it up, represent it. And, you know, the paper gets uh, loses integrity after a couple hundred uh, recycles. Man, I love this spread. I love having like the logos next to each other. There's there's these marks that uh, Brezniak brings in for fire mm -hmm. stuff like this, uh, straight from like Otomo, and you see other like um, the Fukushima Devilfish. Like there there are these little texture marks that are lost in a lot of shonen manga. Like you don't see it in, you know. Dragon Ball or One Piece or anything like that, but it's the it's the older generation of mangaka who would have that kind of shorthand, where it was actual practical done on the paper. I like uh, he's trying to do you know that detailed kind of buildings and stuff, and and you know maybe a tomo the top of the of the ladder for that kind of detail, but it actually reminds me of like Scott McCloud's Destroy, you yeah. know where it's a simplified shorthand for a city, but trying to be detailed but almost too straight up and down. Um, the kind of kind of fun to call back to, uh, you know, the stuff that I see uh, that would be common common links. Look at this man! It's very it's Van Gogh. It is Van Gogh, Starry Night, completely. <laughs> but here we get to the scale, where it's just page after page of just nose, talent, like. And uh, you see Mr. Monster, all his allies are leaving, his girlfriend, his Japanese allies, everybody's fleeing the scene, man, once, once the giant kaiju shows up. Look at the calf muscle on Godzilla. <laughs> yeah, look at those textures, right? Like, like lot, big, I, thick brush. There's a lot of fun stuff in here. You talk about his uh, Rusnik's drawing chops, and it's like, that's pretty good, man. You could tell me Spain Rodriguez is drawing that gun. You could tell me Jack Kirby's drawing that gun. Whatever it is, like, that's a good panel. Ken, don't compare yourself to Chaikin and Steranko with the art chops, man. Your, your work is cool, man. It is, and it's good storytelling, giant foot stepping on him, and then we see the footprint. It reads. It's very easy to read, and uh, Mr. Monster gets hold of that Godzilla's tail, and now he starts his ascent. Yeah. 
Shades I, of uh, Punisher versus Galactus in here. There's there's a uh, I think it's Dean Haspiel did a uh, Godzilla comic where it was like uh, um, like a mountain climber guy. Like the whole comic was a, a guy scaling Godzilla. Makes uh, so sense it to me. Uh, if you do something like this, you, you need a cool shape. For that tale, sell the movement and whatnot, and Brosniak rises to the occasion. Yeah, I wonder if this is something that goes back to Stranko, where it's like this directional device that you know you're reading across, and now we're back to back to the bottom left corner. It is, it's, it's good comics, as you say, Ed. Like, it all works. Gorgeous. And he again, every two page spread, it seems like he takes advantage of the scale that's available by having the two pages. Drawing so much tough stuff. Real hard to draw. I think that's Michael T. Gilbert. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, now and then you'll see uh, Michael T. Gilbert pop in, and you can use Mr. Monster as the gauge as to, like, okay, this is the different line work. Must be uh, Michael T. Gilbert at work here. I also think that uh, besides manga, we're, we all grew up watching Godzilla monster movies, right? Like, that's what this really is uh, your homage to, and, and probably a better fit with the character named Mr. Monster. Right. Yeah, yeah, it is just it is silly thinking of this as like a manga parody, because like that's like golden age panel construction and stuff. Right. The the and, reading and layout is not at all manga esque. Yeah, it's super verbose. Yeah, but, probably but, one but, of the big giveaways. You know, that's what parody would be like back in the day. Like it would be the most superficial elements. Like I feel like it was like like you who who like really took it to that like earnest place of like I'm going to like completely deconstruct. The thing and present you a comic with that with that vibe but with the modern sensibility or modern filter or something like that man like these old parodies they would just be so tangentially parodying the stuff even even going back to uh mad really because it would still be ma a mad format comic but like archie would look like archie it wouldn't right. be an archie comic it's funny you say, I was thinking, like, you could go back to the sincerity, you could go back to Mad. You know, like, like those old Kurtzman, I always think, like, you can't do Super Duper Man if you don't love the the source material, you know? Right. If there isn't some sincere, like, uh, fondness here by the guys that are putting this together. And I don't know whether that's the case or not, but once again, <laughs> fantastic, right? Totally. Mr. Monster staring down the eye of, of, uh, of our Godzilla stand in here. And there, these are kind of your funny gag bits, you know, that you would see thrown into a Mad Magazine or a Crack Magazine of a parody of, you know, almost commenting on the comic, you know, like meta elements where they're rating his dive or his fall. And, to and Tokyo just erupting in flames. When, when, I, when I was out there, um, when I was out there in, in 2019, I went to the Tokyo Edo Museum and then you get, you realize like that town has burnt down and been rebuilt like five times and it kind of makes sense with like how modern it is, good good public transportation. Like well, like whenever they rebuild, it's like state of the art everything. But uh, that's what this reminds me of, man. Like just burns down, got to rebuild. Yeah, you know the I think the having Michael T. Gilbert's hand on these pages actually might help the uh, like the parody feeling of this or the or the manga feeling of it because it does look like different art. You know, yeah. like, it may not be exactly what we know to be manga, but it does feel different than what we know to be Mr. Monster. And it kind of, I don't know, man, it all just works. Like, I hate framing this as parody because in my mind, this was one of the coolest books I pulled out of a 50 cent box in a while and was excited to bring it on here to show it to you to talk yeah. about it. Um, because I think it does look so cool and it works so well. And some of this stuff, like having two different artists contribute, it's almost like an, a, a happy accident. If you're going to do Mr. Monster, you, you need to have some of Mr. Monster in there, you know, in a way that looks like Mr. Monster. But it creates this like really nice, you know, cross between like something weird is going on here. Sure. No, it's a it's a really it's a really cool comic. It makes me call to mind too because Eric Larson is publisher of Image. Whenever this is when this is published, it calls to mind like the uh, the Don Simpson Eric Larson. Megaton Man, Savage Dragon crossover, you know, like any of these crossovers where you have two creators with their characters and they're both hands are on the page, kind of calls to mind that. It's just this one's a little bit probably more strange than uh, than typical. And you can see this is the Mr. Monster back catalog, which is kind of uh, kind of incredible as you like read through these. It's a different publisher, I think, for like every single one of these. Tundra, Deadline, Caliber, uh, Graffiti Designs, you know, like... 
It's quite a journey Mr. Monster has taken over the decades, and, and I love it. And, I love seeing that. And it's a big, it's a big comic for that era of comics reader. Like those guys, like like the Chris Pitzer generation mm-hmm. of of comics readers. They're telling us about Elementals. They're telling us about Grendel and Mage. Totally. They're, they're also telling us about ElfQuest, and they're telling us about Mr. Monster. Yeah, definitely in that '80s, like uh, first first wave of direct market creator ownership stuff. Like this is one of those uh, one of those characters. William Messner Loeb's Journey. It's those guys telling us these kinds of things. I used to get Mister Monsters. There was a, a time where he did mini series. I think it was with Eclipse, and they would reprint like old '50s and pre code. I pulled a bunch of comics that stuff and for stuff, future like episodes. Bob Powell, exactly. Um, probably first time I saw Bob Powell knew to like go buy these, you so, know, go track these down. Crime comics, Jack stuff like Jack that. Cool mm-hmm. stuff uh, shows up in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. Like whenever, like Eclipse figured out that these comics were in the public domain or something, and they found a MacGuffin to try to sell you. <laughs> I was going to say things. Eclipse, or, or maybe Michael T. Gilbert figured this out. Either way, know. man, it's uh, sell a couple extra comics with that stuff. But it was probably the first time I saw Murder, Morphine, and Me. I think is reprinted in there in uh, the, the famous Jack Cole controversial needle to the eye gimmick. Injury to the eye, baby. Yeah, gotta love it. Frederick Wortham uh, was right. It's a weird one for you guys out there in Kayfabe Nation to uh, add this to your, your your digging pile whenever you're getting in those 50-cent boxes. This is a good one if you come across you it. You pulled it from the 50-cent box, but because of the Kayfabe effect, it might cost you a buck 50. <laughs> Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. will notify you when new vids are available. What is out there, Jimmy? Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg where you can download about a dozen of my out-of-print zines and mini-comics. You can see a lot of my original art, scripts, layouts, the process that I make, the comics I make, at patreon.com slash jimrug. Red Room Comics in the wild, man. The anti-social network trade paperback in stores right at this moment. Going fast, man. Scoop it up if you see it, because uh, it's going to take a while for those reprints to hit. And Red Room trigger warnings got pushed back uh, because of paper shortages to February. And uh, the orders couldn't be completely, like, had to cut off orders a little early so this is going to be a scarce comic and i want that thing to sell out on day one links in our link trees in the description below this video to get to all of our places including our patreons what else jim subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video you can also find cartoonist kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video like our latest uh, an homage to roddy roddy piper's uh, villain shirts uh, cartoonist kayfabe available in those links below I'll, this video. I want to see people rocking this when we're in Hawaii next week, man. <laughs> yes. All right, man. Given those martial orders, we're going to be on our way. Read more comics.